it's a lost soul that comes face to face with the seeker of lost souls. And you think, ah, oh, that's, I don't know if that's too interesting. But it is when you read the very next verse. I think it could very easily encapsulate the majority of everything Jesus did in this sentence. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's the whole purpose. And I know it's very simple tonight, but I want to try to get us to realize that if that is Jesus' purpose, what's ours? What's ours? Lord, we thank you for your word tonight. God, I pray for your help, your unction. God, that we would truly walk hand in hand with you and step for step as you order our steps. Too many times, God, we find ourselves doing our own thing and wanting you to be like some mascot or lucky charm, God. We've missed the whole purpose of the plan of salvation and the church. We are so thankful for your presence, your love, and your mercy. And we ask for your touch tonight. And everybody say in Jesus' name. God bless you. You can be seated. Jesus sought out Zacchaeus. I believe, and I could digress on that, he sought me out, and he drew me. Not only do I believe that, I know it to be true even in the word. John chapter 3, beginning at verse 16. Everybody's so familiar with it, but I'm going to read through verse 19. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Should. Everybody say should. But of everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might, and we say might, be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Are you hungry? Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. Here's the condemnation. Here, people get mad. People get upset. People because when you're told the truth and you're not living it, it's very easy to feel condemned. And you're going to get mad at the person pointing out the wrong. People hide behind, you're judging me. Right? Mm -hmm. But listen, because he says it in a very interesting way. That light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. We don't like to think that about ourselves. All that being said, Jesus is on a rescue mission. He is trying to rescue the souls of humanity. Look to the neighbor to your right or to your left. For those of you online, look, look to your friends and your family, people next to you. The Lord wants to save them. A few months back, for those of you that were here, I spoke about a historic Coast Guard rescue. One of the greatest small boat rescues ever in the history of the United States Coast Guard on February the 18th, 1952, during a severe, what they call a nor'easter off the New England coast. There were two tankers, the Fort Mercer and the Pendleton, that in the storm each broke in half. Coast Guard vessels, aircrafts, uh, lifeboat stations working under severe storm, winter storm conditions, rescued 70 persons from the floundering, foundering ships. 
five Coast Guardsmen earned the gold medal life-saving medal, four earned the silver life-saving medal, and 15 earned the Coast Guard Commendation Medal. So I want to, again, use that courageous rescue mission to make practical connections to our mission as the church. I'm not talking about the church building. I'm talking about the church. The church are people that believe the truth, committed to the truth, and earnestly working in the harvest field of humanity. If you're going about your business and not your father's business, there are things you're going to have to wait to find out where you're really at and who you're serving. So on the night of February the 18th in 1952, when a terrible storm, so storm, came roaring into Cape Cod, it was so much fiercer than what they thought. And they found themselves caught in a, in a terrible storm that literally broke two tankers in half. Well, broke one in half and the other one was flipped over. One ship was able to get out of Mayday. The other one was not able to and in the turmoil had lost its ability to send message. So nobody was, was even aware that they were in trouble, if you remember the story. But the Coast Guard responded by mounting a, a major rescue attempt and they threw everything they had at the ship that was able to get out the message that they were in trouble. There were 33 men stranded on that ship that was discovered by accident. As they went to help another ship, they found the other one. By accident. <laughs> because they were looking, they found someone in need. Because they were doing what they were called to do, they found more than what they were looking for. Now, the fact that they had sent so many people out, there were no experienced people left, if you remember the story. And so when they found out and a plane flew over and saw this other ship, they went to an inexperienced crew of young men that had been thrown together and sent them out into the mouth of that terrible storm in an insufficient 36-foot wooden rescue boat. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. The waves of that storm were nearly twice as high as their boat was long. A young man who was the captain of that ship for this moment was Bernie Weber. He was put in charge and sent out into this storm, freezing winter weather. And against the odds, he and his crew answered the call. Isn't that the question that's being asked right now? Isn't that the question that's being asked of all those that claim Christianity? Isn't that the real question that we have to look in the mirror and go, you know, I call myself a Christian, but based on what? If I told you I was a race car driver, you would expect to see me racing a race car, wearing a highly decorated, sponsored, filled, fireproof, retardant, full body suit, stepping into a a vehicle and joining the left turn only circuit. That's a subtle jab, right? If I was a professional golfer, you'd expect to see me with the clubs now and then. You'd probably wait and next time you go get your hair cut at Sport Clips, maybe see a glimpse of me on the, the telly or the TV as they say here in the United States. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And 
You may not run and jump today, but I want you tonight, but I want you to be honest with yourself. I don't want anybody under my pastor to not know that Jesus has an expectation. Don't get frustrated with God because we don't line up with his word. Don't get mad at the preacher. Let me help you. Take kids, students. Don't get mad at the teacher for telling mom and dad you're not showing up. Don't get mad at the teacher when you get the report card and it's not what you ex was hoping for if you didn't show up or do the work. Today, it's very clear that our society is no longer leaning towards being a godly society. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Or do, do, do you really hear what I'm saying? You have to understand, we live in a culture right now a five-year-old can't smoke a cigarette, can't have a beer, and shouldn't. You wouldn't let them drive a car. But they can choose to take hormones to change their gender. Does that upset any of you? Because you know how wrong that is. Well, what's that got to do with this? Can I just be honest? If you're not doing the things of God, are you the people of God. If you're not driving a race car, you're not a race car driver. If you're not doing the things that are very clearly stated in his word, you're not his. Now, I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad. I'm trying to get, hey, wait a minute. If you're going to get in this thing, get in this thing. I get there's going to be bad days. There's going to be slow days. There's going to be down days. But on a consistent basis, there should be over a period of time an honest view of who and what you are by what you're doing. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So here we've got inexperienced men being thrown into a storm. Now, a lot of us in our inexperience, wait a minute. Why would God throw me right in the middle of it? Because the need is so great and the call is so sure that sometimes he has to look over those that are so busy to find those that are willing to go. It wouldn't seem to make sense to send these guys out. But when it's a calling, it's a calling. When it's what you do, it's what you do. I'm reminded of how Jesus viewed the mission of the church and its importance and the risk to his followers. He said in Matthew 10 and 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. I, I'm sending you out there. Hey, 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 let me say that. Quit thinking that, well, I don't like how this feels, and I don't like knocking doors, and I don't like teaching Bible studies, or, or I graduated from that. Wait a minute. I'm sending you. If God can't send you, then you're not his. Matthew 5 and 11, blessed are ye. You know, the other one started with blessed are ye. Listen to this, Luke 6. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. I can honestly say there's a whole lot of people friendly with the wrong people because it's easier to turn your back on Jesus because the word ain't going to jump right out of the Bible and slap you going, hey, what about what this says? Does that make sense? Because there's a day coming. How many here? Never going to die. Your body's going to lay down. You're going to give up the ghost. We're going to have to stand before God. Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. For them to speak falsely about you for his sake, you got to be doing something for his sake. <laughs> are you hearing what I'm saying? Rejoice. Maybe the reason some people haven't been able to rejoice or worship or get sad about Jesus because you're not doing anything for him. 
Maybe you're upset all the time or having a hard time with pastor and church and church people and doing stuff around here because you thought it was all about you and you forgot that you were bought with a price. And the world has had a greater effect on your mind and your thinking and your actions than Jesus has. Can we be honest? You're, you're not, I'm a, I'm, I, I hate to break it to you, but I wish I'd have been a great student. Now, I'm going to tell you here right now, I didn't even scratch the surface, surface of the abilities that I'm mentally capable of because I didn't apply myself. I don't know how many times my dad gave me lectures. My mom gave me looks. <laughs> I don't know how many times I had to carry that ridiculous report card that I knew was about to send me into a, a week of pain, turmoil, and trouble, wishing that somehow them grades and statements would change, knowing and watching as waiting for my dad to come home simply because I didn't apply myself. We are so quick as a people to pick out the faults and, and, and to point at, at things in society and be upset about certain things when, you know what, there's something about us. We better get back in the Word as Christians. We better get back into what Jesus really had to say about his people because it really it's hurtful to know that he can turn and say to people, I never knew you. The same people, didn't I do a bunch of wonderful things in your name? No, you did your things in my name. You didn't do my things in my name. Are you hear what I'm saying? For my sake, rejoice in being exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. See, we're thinking we should be rewarded right now. And many times we think because we get a few things, we get a couple of bucks stored up and get a nice house and a nice car, nice education plaques on the wall, get a little free time. That You may have just been enticed by the world right out of your blessing of heaven. Because he said, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Do you realize what he just said there? Those that have gone before me set the example for me. How much like Paul's life, like Stephen's life, like Peter's life, like Andrew's life, like I could just, listen, it takes courage. It takes courage to say no to looking successful to where everybody gives you a pat on the back out there. You know, Brother Corey, there's just going to be people at your work that are going to think you're nuts after a long day at work, that you're going to show up to this church, and you're going to pay your tithes, and you're going to mow the grass, and you're going to help with the ushering and the offering, and you're going to bring your family, and they're all going to ridicule, and they're all going to think you're crazy as they run around and do all these other things for the world, but there's a day coming when the reward will be great. There's a day coming where the war, hey, there ain't going to be no one. You're not going to care if anybody patted you on the back. You're not going to care if people thought you were cool. You're not going to care if your neighbors thought, wow. No, you're not going to care if anybody ever gave you any accolades here because the one that mattered, the one that really mattered, and says to you, right to your face, enter in and well done, thou good and faithful servant. You joined me on the rescue mission. Many bailed. Many wouldn't risk it. Many wanted to save their own life, and they refused to go on a rescue mission. It takes courage to launch out into the storm of society. It takes courage to stand up in this day and age and be a Christian, not just in word, but in deed, and to stand up and offer a Bible study and, and tell someone about your church and hand out a church card and give a Bible. It takes courage. You want to find courage? You find a saint of God doing the work of God. There's no courage in showing up. There are false churches and teachings all across the planet with people flocking to him. But God is looking for those that will honestly go on the rescue mission.
And he said unto them in Mark chapter 16, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. It takes courage to launch into the storm. Those four young Coast Guard men launched out into what looked like a lost cause. We've been handed a rescue mission as a church. And like that small boat crew, we've been called to go out into the stormy seas of this life to rescue souls before it's too late. You have to understand the clock is ticking. The clock is is ticking, and whether the Lord comes or I expire before that moment, the clock is ticking. I will be judged not by my intentions, but by my deeds. And tonight, I just want to touch this story because as they prepared to go out into that storm, a small crowd had heard and gathered around that little boathouse and to watch these brave young sailors launch out into that terrible storm. While they did, history tells and uh, Bernie Weber tells of an old sailor that walked up next to the boat and offered his advice to those young men, those young sailors. You guys might want to get lost out there before you get too far out. It was his way of saying, you know, in the kindest words possible, don't take this thing too far. Turn back while you can and save your lives. Don't risk your own lives on a mission that really looks doomed to failure. I don't know about you, but many times elders have an impression upon me. There's something about the Bible telling us to honor and respect the hoary or the gray head. Of course, I'm hoping I keep mine long enough to do that, but <laughs> but regardless of that warning, regardless of that message of self-preservation, Bernie Weber and his crew of three launched into a dark, cold storm. And as they approached what was known as Chatham's Sandbar, the most treacherous place where the waves break high and harsh. His crew already struggling against the freezing wetness of the winter storm. The boat struck by 60-foot waves. He realized in living color how meager his little lifeboat was against the mission. It was at this point as he peered into the mouth of that great storm of his inadequate, inadequate lifeboat, being scared, nearly freezing to death, he was forced to make a decision that could very well cost the lives of his crew. He tells the story and he says, in my mind, I said, do I turn back? Do I go ahead? What do I do now? Deep down, and he said, I knew that I really wouldn't be criticized for turning. There's going to be plenty that'll receive you and pat you on the back and, and give you the, the condolences of, let me put it this way, wimping out. I get it. You had a lot of other stuff going for you. It didn't make sense to die for the mission. He knew that old sailor's advice at the pier was good advice. In his mind, he could justify it. Why add to the tragedy of my life or sending four men to their deaths for this mission? One bit of information, a piece of the story that I haven't shared yet in regards to Bernie. His father was a pastor. In fact, his dad had wanted Bernie to follow in his footsteps. He always envisioned his son following him into the ministry. 
In fact, his father was a little bit disappointed when he joined the Coast Guard. He had often told Bernie that the one thing he wanted most of all was for his son to serve God. Bernie would later recount in the moments before sailing off into that storm that he realized he was indeed serving God. He would later say that he received great strength and courage in the moments as he came to grips with the understanding that he was doing his duty and didn't shirk his calling. He said that he realized in that moment, that moment right there, he had to attempt a rescue. He realized that he had to stand and launch into this storm the same as his father launched into the storm for souls of men. He had to go into the storm for the souls of men. He had no other choice. He knew no one else was going to go. No one else was going to step out. No one else was going to risk it. This was part of his calling, and somehow he just knew that he was born to do this against all odds. So in that lifeboat, pitching up and down in canyon-sized waves, and as they were being tossed up and down, he began to sing at the top of his lungs a song he learned in his father's church. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. And as he sang, his crew turned and joined in that song with him. And they became a little church on the stormy seas in a dark winter storm in the midst off of Cape Cod. And just like the church today, we need to launch out into our world, refusing to cower and shirk away from the call of God. And if we got to sing at the top of our lungs, rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. In many ways, it was a religious moment for Bernie and his crew. They put their faith in God in the midst of that storm. That tiny wooden lifeboat ran into the mammoth 60-foot wave after 60-foot waves, tossing the boat like a toy, sometimes even being totally airborne and coming crashing back down, wave after wave, knocking them down one violent wave hit the boat so hard it shattered the windshield it sent sharp shards of glass back into Bernie's face he fell backward the wave hit so hard it spun the boat around and it, the, the, the bow was now facing the shore it was a dangerous position for the boat and the crew he pulled himself up off the deck tempted to steer the boat back into the seas before it could be flipped over with the windshield broken, the violent sea spray, the snow, the sleet that came through the cabin pelted his skin, and his face that had been cut by the glass was now burning and he was open wounds. Blindly pointed the boat back toward the next oncoming wave, and despite the crashing seas and the terrible beating, they all endured. wave after wave, till he realized that the wave that had shattered the windshield had also torn away from its mount the boat's compass. And now their sole means of navigation was gone. So now we add into another very biblical dilemma for Bernie. He would have to navigate in the storm and darkness on instinct alone. He would have to sail through this storm by faith and not by sight. That sound a little familiar to anybody here? 
Does that sound a little bit familiar to someone? You're going through a storm and you don't know what to do or which way to go. So, man, Jesus, just help me. I'm going to go by faith. I'm going to walk by faith. I'm going to keep going by faith. The Bible tells us Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And you and I are called to that very same mission. Oh, have you ever asked yourself why Jesus had to seek the lost? have to seek the lost was he not surrounded by the lost was he not surrounded by lost souls brother why would he have to seek the lost everywhere he went everyone he met needed his message of salvation it was what you call a target rich environment wherever he went he came to seek and to save the lost He did have to seek the lost before he could save them. I used to be an avid outdoorsman. Fishing is what was one of my favorite things to do. I had a school buddy back in high school by the name of Ed Smith. And he had access to some private lakes and ponds up in the hills, the rich area where we lived. It's a beautiful place, absolutely stunningly beautiful lakes and ponds. You go there and I'm talking healthy big bass, big crappie, bluegills that were like slabs of meat the size of a dinner plate. It was just ridiculous, awesome. In fact, I could pull my yearbook out and show you his little caption in there. He said, one of these days we'll go fishing while I catch more fish than you. Never happened. <laughs> It's a beautiful place to fish. We go there, and there's no question the fish were there. So the issue in catching the fish wasn't in finding the fish. We knew where they were. They were all around us. The secret was finding one hungry enough to bite. And eventually, with a little work, and that was me because I just, I had this, I had this personal pride issue. I'm catching something. I, it may be a cold, but I'm catching something. And you, you, if you've ever been with me, I'm catching something. Mm -hmm. And eventually we would, we, we'd figure it out. They were, when you have private lake fish, they get squirrely, and they 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 don't have no used to people tramping around the. We literally have to sneak up to those ponds, just because oh we're not biting nothing because we discouraged them. So we you know, so when we found them, we'd start catching them. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But can I tell you something? We never would have found them if we hadn't sought the Lord. When you consider Jesus at the pool of Bethesda, wading through a sea of humanity, broken people, he's completely surrounded by hurting, desperate, and needy people. Another target-rich environment, right? Everywhere he looks, there's someone who needs a miracle. But he did pass by and walk by all of them and sought out this one lone man, this man who has no one to help him get in the water. I, I often wonder what the difference was between that one man and the rest of them he was surrounded with. I kind of believe it was like them bluegill, Brother Lulu. It's that same difference that exists between the fish that I eventually caught and the net, ones that never showed any interest, my bait, hunger. Jesus waited through a crowd to touch one man because that one was desperately hungry. It's so easy to be filled with the things of this life. It's so easy to justify being filled with the things of this life. The question is, are you hungry? 
for God. Listen, he is no more or less needy than anyone else around. There were many others that may have even been worse off than the man that he helped. But there was a difference, and it was a big difference. There was a genuine hunger in his heart that would actually hear and respond to the word of the Lord. You see, it's not about knowing the word. It's about responding to the word because you're hungry for the word. And I believe that's why Jesus singled him out. I, I also believe it explains why Jesus had to seek the lost in order to save them. He, he was surrounded by all that needed him, but they weren't hungry for him. Being used of God isn't about knowing his word. It's about being truly hungry for his word. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Surrounded by so many that needed him, but not all of them were hungry for him. Not all of them were ready to hear and respond to the voice of the Lord. Listen, guys. He seeks those who will hear and respond. Those who have a genuine hunger in their heart. It's all about your approach to the table. It's all about your mentality when you come in here. If you're coming in here and you've missed the men, if you've missed messed up your mentality and it's you've you've lost your desire and you've lost your hunger, it's easy to get an attitude and get frustrated and get angry and get bent out of shape and and, and struggle with things. But if if you have a hunger for God, you, a hunger, uh, a man, you ain't gonna stop a hungry man for me. He ain't gonna complain. He's like, give me what you got, and I'm gonna eat all of it. That brings me to the point tonight's lesson, the crux of it. In the sea of lost humanity that surrounds us, I want you to just take a moment, wherever you're sitting, right in hell, those of you listening online, close your eyes and start thinking about the sea of people that are around you. If we never seek the hunger, you'll never save the lost. Can you see their faces? Can you see their names? That's great. But are you ready to reach for their soul? Jesus told his disciples, I will make you fishers of men. That's our calling. That's our, that's our purpose. To seek the lost. To find the hungry. The question is, that tonight's lesson seeks to answer is, how do you do that? How do you seek the lost? In the midst of the storm, Brian Weber found himself with no compass. He merely had to navigate by sheer instinct alone. Can I suggest maybe that's how you do it? spiritual instinct? How do you develop that kind of instinct? How do you develop spiritual instinct? What's, what's the Bible say? Paul made a statement in Romans chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Paul said, my prayer to God is for the Israelites to be saved. What is your prayer to God? Are you asking or telling? In your prayer, is it for people? Is it for your own family members? Is it for your friends and neighbors? Paul said they believed in God, but they didn't know him. There are a lot of people like that in your life. They believe in God, but they don't really know him. Or perhaps I simply don't know him, 
in the biblical way that he wants them to know them, to know him. So how do you reach them? How do you make a difference? And I don't want to hurt your feelings because honestly, it's simple. It starts with your prayer life and not God's response. The Bible talks about us asking amiss because when you make it your heart's desire in prayer. See, Paul in Colossians 4 and 3 expressed this prayer request. Listen. With all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. Paul prayed for an open door to speak the mystery of Christ. Is that how you pray? Have you prayed that God open the door for me to preach Jesus? So could the difference be simply, Lord, give me an opportunity to share the gospel. Lord, open that door of opportunity for me to be a witness today. I have found, and even in my own life, many times I'm always praying for what I want, for what I need. Many times I even find myself praying for what I think God should do or what I want him to do. Are you hearing me? Can, let me, can, can I just for a moment briefly here, I'm going to wrap this up, share an idea about prayer. What did I preach about Sunday morning? The Lord is my shepherd. He leadeth me. He leads me. How many want that? I know that some of us will be in trouble if we jump up and down and say, that's me, that's me, because we've been very selfish. And let, me, let me just try to shed some light on this. Can you imagine if we said, Lord, Lead me into your harvest. Lead me into your harvest because there is a difference between your harvest and the Lord's harvest. There's a difference between what you think you need, what you think people need, and what God knows they need. You know who you want to reach, right? Friends, family, loved ones. But you and I cannot discern on our own who among them is really hungry. Are you hearing me? The Lord, however, knows the hearts of men and women. He knows who's hungry. And that's the difference between reaching for your harvest and reaching for the Lord's harvest. Lord, lead me into your harvest. Literally, pray specifically, Lord, I need you to open a door in my life that I could reach into your harvest. That's maturity. That's maturity. Many of us pray, we want God to do this, we want God to do that. In Acts chapter 9, there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. This is Acts 9 and 11. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayed for me. Let's stand. There's a world of hungry people. Oh, there's a world of people full. But in the midst of all that crowd, there's a whole bunch of hungry people. But what good is a 
satisfied, full of the world church that's not praying. For the harvest. We all pray for revival because we think, oh, that's exciting, and we want to say, well, let me tell you something. Revival is something dead coming to life. So revival is for you and me, but harvest is for them. Some of us, yeah, pray indeed, pray for revival that you'll come back from the dead of selfish prayers and lives to God. Open the door of your harvest to me. Open the door. Notice they're both, one is talking to the Lord and one's praying. How many of you, how many of us, how many churches are one hungry prayer away from knocking on the door of a call? How many of us right now might be a simple, hungry for God prayer away from reaching one of the most important people that can impact our world right now? Simply praying each morning, Lord, lead me to a soul today. Lord, you're coming. You're coming for a church. Help me witness to one person today. Don't let my job just be a place I go to, for the almighty dollar, but allow me to navigate the dark storm of this world, even at my job, that I can have a door open, that I can harvest, Lord, and find a hungry soul at my job, at my school, at my library, at my grocery. No matter where I go, help me to seek the lost. Closing, I just want to touch on. said that when they were caught in the grip of the storm, was the whole scene that's in the lost. It was in those moments that he honestly contemplated turning back. So he would focus his thoughts on those men that were out there that would be lost. In his mind's eye, he would picture those men floundering, trapped on that giant steel castle. And he knew that he and his crew were their only hope. And it was that that compelled him and his men to press on. And I tell you that from the moment that you make up your mind to reach a lost soul, you will be confronted. Every conceivable doctrine known to man, you're going to have to be running over here for this and for that because that's, you're going to have to be busy with things that when you stand before God will mean nothing. You'll even be faced with again and again the temptation of being willing to remain silent, to hold the peace, and to just fit in. Both with that Jesus stuff. Don't endanger the friendship. Let everyone think, well, they know they know they know. Are you hearing me? We're living in a world today. We're living in America. Let me tell you something. I'm as patriotic as the next guy, but America can say no more. Being patriotic ain't gonna get you into heaven. It's not. So it's in these times right now that we face that our focus needs to shift to the souls that are caught in sin's terrible grip. A lost world needs to become our motivation. 
that compels us to complete the mission to seek and to save. For a second, I want you to stop. Real, right now, somebody had to risk the relationship to tell you the truth. You can be lost right now. Too many Christians fail to remember that Jesus said come to see to save those who are lost. If you want to be like Jesus, share the same divine purpose, passion, and plan of the one who went all the way to Calvary for us. Really, Sunday, a famous evangelist made a statement. You can't hatch chicks under a dead hand. The Lord told us, go into the highways, Jesus. Compel them to come in that my house may be In the lost parables, he talks about the lady had to go and search and search and search. The lost sheep, he had to go search. The Great Commission declares to us to go and seek the lost. Does it move you? Maybe I'm irritated. Maybe we become so dependent on a weekly thread that we are no longer committed to the cause. Preach me feeling excited, Pastor. Sing a song that I like to sing so I can get all excited about my religious experience and walk right back outside those doors to go do everything but the focus of God. There's a song. It's an old song, not a song you remember, but I'm going to do my best to read it. Throw out the lifeline across the dark wave. There is a brother who someone should say. Somebody's brother, oh, who then will dare to throw out the lifeline, his peril to share. Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline. Someone is drifting away. Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline. Someone is sinking today. Throw out the lifeline with hand quick and strong. Why do you tarry? Why linger so long? See, he is seeking, oh, hasten today, and out with the lifeboat away. Throw out the lifeline to danger, fraught pen, sinking in anguish where you never have been. Winds of temptation and billows of woe will soon hurl them out where dark waters flow. Soon will the season rescue be over. Soon will they drift to eternity shore. Hasten then, my brother, no time for delay. Throw out the lifeline and save them today. This is the lifeline, O tempest-tossed men, baffled by waves of temptation and sin. Wild winds of passion your strength cannot brave. But Jesus is by Jesus can save. That's a song to remember. That's a song to quote. The Bible goes on. He said, this is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that he lay his life down for his friends. The Bible says in Romans, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet for a venture, for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Are you here? Are there any rescuers here today? Are there any Christians here today? Is there anybody here today that's willing to have compassion and make a difference? 
willing to step out into the foray, pulling them out of the fire like you declared? Are you ready to run a mission, a rescue mission in the name of Jesus? Is your Christianity strong enough, and are you ready to step out of the tide pool of baby steps and ready to join the hands with Jesus and storm the gates of hell to reach the lost?